In 1992, Las Vegas developer Westwood Studios took a genre that was in its nascent stages and molded it into the fully formed real-time strategy. Featuring numerous units that had to be paid for by a limited resource and unlocked by different structures, Dune 2 became a landmark title that merged fast-paced action with mind-bending strategy. For all that, the game didn't make a huge impact on the market, and it was years before another strategy game was released. That just gave Westwood all the time they needed to perfect their formula. In 1995, they unleashed Command & Conquer, a smash success that turned RTS into a mainstream genre. All of a sudden, every publisher wanted top-down games with buildings chugging out scores of soldiers. But Westwood wasn't about to sit around and let other developers take their glory. In the coming years, they released a slew of Command & Conquer titles that cemented its status as the premier RTS franchise. And they did it so well that Westwood itself got conquered by the biggest name in the industry. While researching military technology for the original Command & Conquer, Westwood had encountered a number of crazy experiments. From invisibility to invincibility, the 20th century had tried out some pretty wacky ideas. While none of them had worked in the real world, Westwood realized they could spin a yarn in which they had. After all, Command & Conquer was more about fun than realism. Why not have some fun with history? So Westwood let themselves go nuts. They said, if Einstein invented a time machine, of course he would immediately use it to go back and remove Hitler from history, which would only naturally lead to a different world war in which the Soviet Union was the aggressor, and those Soviets would indubitably possess lightning-spewing Tesla coils. So it's off to war with tanks, guard dogs, teleporters, bigger tanks, and Tanya. As if you couldn't tell, the camp factor was ratcheted up through the roof, allowing for fun times with Joseph Stalin while you wipe out an entire village. Yep. When you kill one, it is a tragedy. When you kill 10 million, it is a statistic. <laughs> it was absolutely ridiculous in the best way possible. While not a drastic departure from the original formula, it did hone and refine everything that made the first game work. It also further differentiated the two sides, giving players a reason to get through both campaigns and adding variety to the multiplayer. Story-wise, it initially seemed unconnected to the original game since it was taking place in a parallel timeline. Of course, Command & Conquer existed in a parallel universe too, and tellingly, the new game's first title was Command & Conquer Zero. But though Westwood later claimed it had a grand strategy for linking their first franchise with the new one, they never got to implement it. Regardless, Command & Conquer Red Alert released in October 1996, only a year after the first title. It was universally praised for refining and perfecting the CNC formula, itself a refinement of the Dune 2 formula. Despite its similarities to its predecessor, its new setting, wild storyline, and fantastic balance cemented Westwood's reputation as the king of the genre they'd created in the first place. While working on expansion packs for Red Alert, Westwood decided to try an experiment of their own. In November 1997, they released Command & Conquer Soul Survivor, an online-only game in which the player controlled one unit. Just one. While collecting power-ups, he would face off against other players and their one unit. The idea was that after commanding so many of these units, it might be fun to scale it down to the personal level and play as one hero in that world. Soul Survivor, sadly, did not connect with audiences and was ignored almost upon release. Westwood would revisit that one character philosophy later. However, despite the overwhelming success of the studio, owner Virgin Interactive wasn't feeling the same success. It got so bad that even after VI's owner, The Spelling Group, put them up for sale, nobody was buying. Not until The Spelling Group offered to sell VI in separate pieces did they get an offer. And it was from the biggest name in all of gaming. Electronic Arts had watched Westwood come out of left field to become a dominant PC developer, and they wanted them for themselves. For $123 million in 1998, EA acquired Westwood from Virgin Interactive 
and as part of the same deal, also got Virgin's development house in Irvine, California. EA then chose to put this second house directly under Westwood's supervision, and was renamed Westwood Pacific. The Irvine studio was quickly put to work on their Las Vegas Cousins signature series. But in the meantime, Westwood proper was putting the finishing touches on their own follow-up. This time, they wouldn't be creating a parallel timeline, but continuing the story of the game that had made their name. Command & Conquer Tiberian Sun released in August 1999, a direct sequel to the 1995 original. Or at least, a direct sequel to the good guy campaign from the original. If you played through as the bad guys, well, never mind that then. Unsurprisingly, the game was given a much higher budget this time around, leading to improved graphics and more features. The cutscenes, too, were given a boost. Instead of sticking with a static first-person perspective with no-name actors, in Tiberian Sun, they went for a full cinematic event. The camera switched to third-person, cutting between various angles of scenes with Hollywood talent like James Earl Jones and Michael Bean. Sir, I think I know what Kane is up God to. God damn it, Mac. Find out where those fighters are coming from and shut them down. I don't care what it takes. Ava, fill him in. While the production values may seem low by today's standards, at the time, they were at the bleeding edge of what video games could accomplish. Gameplay-wise, however, most gamers found it little change from its predecessors. Despite adding some new units, the overall feel of the game was pretty much the same as the original. And despite its nine-month delay, some features still felt unfinished. Most notably, a third faction that was supposed to be playable ended up just being an enemy in the campaign. Given that it was the first CNC to release after EA bought Westwood, many fans saw this as a sign that the new Overlord was rushing the game to market. Still, Tiberian Sun was considered a good, if not great, title. None of that stopped the game from selling, as the latest Command & Conquer became the fastest selling PC title in EA's history. Not too shabby. With their original universe revisited, it was now time to revisit the communist era. Command & Conquer Red Alert 2 released in October 2000, but not from Westwood. RA2 was Westwood Pacific's baby, and proved that a different team could still make a first-rate CNC. Because the first Red Alert hadn't been loony enough, Red Alert 2 would feature even bigger tanks, rocketeer infantry, and trained boat-destroying giant squids that could only be defeated by dolphins as the Soviet Union invaded the United States. Yes, the developers apparently failed history class. Fortunately for them, critics and fans alike seem to have flunked as well, since it was praised for finding the perfect balance between fun, accessible, and deep, and is generally considered superior to Westwood's own Tiberian Sun. But as with Tiberian Sun, it was faulted for not really bringing anything new to the table. Westwood was in a difficult position. If they changed anything in their series, they'd be torn apart by fans. But if they didn't, they'd be criticized for resting on their laurels. With all this in mind, and knowing that the story world they'd created was half the fun, Westwood decided to go for broke and leave the genre they'd invented behind. Tune in next time to see Command & Conquer get personal 